Hey, all right, it's time to talk about what happens when you are dealing with a situation involving a limiting reactant in chemistry. Now, to get across the idea of a limiting reactant, I'm going to take an example of two chemicals. What I have is acid, this is hydrochloric acid, and baking soda. Just like acid in the form of vinegar reacts with baking soda to fizzle, uh, you get a similar sort of reaction with hydrochloric acid and baking soda, which I'll show right here. There's the acid, and you put in the baking soda, and it fizzles just like that. So um, this reaction is furthermore an idea. What we mean by limiting reactant is there are two reactants here. There's the baking soda that I put in and the acid. And you'll notice if I add a little more baking soda, the reaction continues even more because there's extra acid left over. Even after the fizzing stops, there's still leftover acid. That means the acid is an excess reactant. The baking soda, on the other hand, is completely getting used up. That makes it a limiting reactant. And to give an idea, it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. I want to show you what happens if you switch that around. What if you have more baking soda and, and I add just a drop of acid? Well, when I do that, obviously, you're going to get the same reaction because it's the same two reactants. But the difference is, in this case, there's way more baking soda than there is acid. So the acid reacts, it fizzles out, it's done, and there's extra baking soda left over. So in this case, now the baking soda is the excess reactant and the acid is the limiting reactant because the acid ran out and there was extra baking soda left over. Whatever runs out is the limiting reactant. Whatever's left over is the excess reactant. That's the concept of what this is. Now, uh, the limiting reactants that we talk about here in the notes, we start out with this example making sandwiches. If you've got enough bread for 30, but enough meat for five, obviously the meat is what runs out first. That makes it the limiting reactant. The limiting reactant is capable of producing less product than the excess reactant that doesn't run out. So take a moment to copy that down if you're working on your note handout right now. But do note that this is kind of a non-chemistry example applying to the chemistry idea of what happens with the limiting reactant. Um, in terms of a more chemical kind of example, here's the hydrogen reactor with oxygen to make water. So this is combustion of hydrogen gas. Um, so remember that your balanced reaction gives you a ratio of not grams, but moles. So this says for every two moles of H2 gas, you need one mole of, eight of O2 gas, and those will make two moles of water as a gas because it's high temperature. Now. Um, the idea is, it's telling you that if you have two moles of hydrogen, you need one mole of oxygen. Or rather, one mole of oxygen requires two moles of hydrogen. So if one mole of oxygen needs two moles of hydrogen, what happens if you have one mole, only one mole of hydrogen paired with one mole of oxygen? That's what this question is asking. What if, yes, one mole of oxygen requires two moles, but what if only one mole is there? Well, the fact is, you can predict what's going to happen. You can do a calculation. If you have one mole of hydrogen, that becomes your given. You set a conversion factor so that mole of hydrogen cancels mole of hydrogen. You're trying to find how many moles of water are made, so there's your moles of water. You take the numbers out of the balanced reaction, just like we've talked about many times. Um, and the idea here is you can calculate that if you had two moles of hydrogen, you'd make two moles of water, whereas if you had only one mole of hydrogen, you would make only one mole of water. It becomes your limiting reactant because one mole of oxygen is enough to make two moles of water, but one mole of hydrogen is only enough to make one mole of water. So your limiting reactant will make less product. So what I've been talking about is this right here. These three vocabulary items, the limiting reactant, the excess reactant, and the stoichiometric mixture. So if you're filling out your notes, fill these in. And take a moment, look over these, okay? Because again, limiting reactant is whatever is completely consumed and runs out. Excess reactant is what's left over, and that means there's, it's capable of forming more product than the limiting reactant. And then stoichiometric mixture, as it says here, is that carefully calculated mixture. It's hard to do in real life, but if you're careful with your calculations and careful with your weighing, you can get just the exact right amount of each reactant so that nothing is left over. That is, take some calculation and some careful measurement, but it is possible to do. Now, having mentioned that, let's look at an actual calculation when you deal with a limiting reactant. Because you've got to figure out how much product is going to make. Remember, I said if you have a limiting reactant, one runs out first, which means 
one of them is going to be left over. And the other thing, like I said earlier, the limiting reactant makes less product. So let me show you, those of you who are watching, take them on, don't copy this down yet, because look closely at this. You'll notice we've done two calculations for this example. Um, what it is, is this is showing how we deal with you having a limiting reactant scenario. And how do you know this? Well, you look at the question. It gives you two reactants, and it tells you how much of two reactants that you have. So what this means is, in a question, if you were just given the mass of one reactant, that would be one calculation. But if you're getting two masses for two different reactants, you know you've got to do two calculations because the big picture here is each reactant, if you do the calculation of how much product you're going to do, it asks you um, how much product you're going to get. So you calculate how much of the product here. And you'll notice the limiting reactant, one, or one of them makes less product, and that is the limiting reactant. One of them, one of the reactants is going to make more product. That's the excess reactant. So um, I don't know why part of the thing is not showing on the side here. It's just a formatting thing. But uh, regardless, at least enough is visible here to make the point that when we do this calculation, if we're trying to figure out the limiting reactant, we have to do two calculations. And then we select the smaller answer as the amount of stuff actually produced. Now, to be fair, in this one, it's not actually asking how much is produced. It's just asking you to identify the limited and excess reactants. What I did here was that I just randomly picked the product for no good reason. I picked this one. I could have done this one, too. I just figured out how much of this will this chemical make, and then how much of this will this chemical make. And then whichever one makes the smaller amount, that's my limiting reactant. Whichever makes the greater amount, this reactant becomes the excess reactant. So that's the excess reactant right there, the H2O. And that's why I've got this conclusion statement right here. All right, so I think that pretty much gets at the bigger idea for that. So I'll leave that there for now.